In which war did you serve, Bill? Uh, Vietnam. What branch of the service? Army. What was yeah. your highest rank? Uh, in Vietnam, uh, CW2, warrant officer. In which general locations in Vietnam did you serve? Uh, I served the whole time in uh, Way, in I Corps. Well, it was actually Camp Eagle just outside of Way. Were you drafted or did you enlist? Uh, well, it was a combination of things. I had gone to school in Michigan for a couple of years, and when I came back, I was immediately sent a notice that I was going to be drafted and I didn't, I didn't want to just be drafted. I kind of always wanted to fly. So I went, joined up, joined the fly. And it so took, you had already been in college? Yes. For and two years. Complete, how many? I got an associate's degree from Northwestern Michigan College. In and then you Traverse came home City, to Michigan. Connecticut? I came home to Connecticut and immediately got a letter that was in, uh, uh, probably late 1967. And um, then I went and joined, and it took uh, it took about ten or eleven months to actually get a class date in aviation school and, and go to um, well, I had to go to basic training, and then we went to uh, Fort Walters, Texas, and from Fort Walters, Texas, we went to Fort Rucker, Alabama. To Where were you living at the time that you enlisted? Connecticut. I'm from, I'm from Connecticut. I always lived in Connecticut. Yep, oh, Wallingford. So you've lived in Wallingford your whole life? Pretty much. Um, when you enlisted, you went down and you enlisted in the Army. At that point, do you get to say, I want to be an aviator? Or, or when you enlist, you just enlist as a general? No, I, I, I went specifically to join to, to be a helicopter pilot. And they let you do that? Yes. Uh, I, had, I had a friend who, uh, we were boyhood friends, and he had gone in the service right out of high school and we graduated in 1965. He had served like two tours of duty in Vietnam in the Army, and then he uh, went to work for Lear Ziegler to do uh, high-maintenance aviation work on helicopters, and he happened to be home for a short period of time, and I talked to him, and he goes, "Oh, he said if you if you're gonna if you're gonna go, fly over it, don't walk through it." So I said, "That sounds like a good idea." So when I I went down and I joined the specific thing, idea that I was going to be a pilot, and then I had to go for psychological testing and evaluation. Uh, I had to take all kind all kinds of tests and talk to all kinds of people, and then they they finally let me in. So you did all the testing here in Connecticut before you were accepted? Into right. I, I think I think the only thing I had to do, I think I had to go up to Boston for something to talk to somebody. When you enlisted, um, was that still in 1967? It might have might have been the early part of 68. I don't exactly remember. I, I know that it took almost all of 1968 to actually get a class date and, and then actually go because I didn't actually leave for the military until November of 68. Then I had to go, I had to go to um, basic training first. So November of 68 is when you went to basic? Yep. And where was that? Fort Polk, Louisiana. How long was the basic training? Way too long. <laughs> Tell no, me what it was, basic training was. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I'm pretty sure it was supposed to be eight weeks, but what happened is right in the middle of it, there was a spinal meningitis outbreak in the part of the camp that I was in, and uh, they uh, sent everybody home for, for 30 days. They cleared the place right out. Meningitis so it was like was a pretty break serious. in training, so you went and you started training? Went, they, they, sent, they sent us home, and they said, you have to be back here in 30 days, and so that's what I did. I just went home, just stayed home for 30 days, and then went back, went back down there and fin finished up. What kinds of things did they teach you in basic? Um, <laughs> pre pretty pretty basic stuff. I mean, a lot of it was physical physical training, um, shooting. Which it, per personally, I didn't get a lot out of basic training. 
I, I was already, I, I consider myself to be a pretty disciplined person. So I, I didn't, didn't really need the discipline. I didn't have a problem with that. And the, and the physical part, I was in much better physical shape than most of the people in there. So I didn't have a problem with that. And I could shoot, so. <laughs> you could already shoot when oh, yeah. you went in? Yeah. After your basic training, where did you go? After basic, we went to Fort Walters, Texas for primary helicopter training. Do you recall how long? Um, Uh, around probably how long? probably around five months. So what kinds of things did you learn there? That that was basic flight training uh, in helicopters. But the first the first the first four weeks was just a introductory type thing where you re really didn't even get anywhere near a helicopter or a classroom. Uh, you just uh, got yelled at and screamed at a lot, and then they they weeded out a lot of people. We started out with probably a class of probably a couple hundred in the class, but at the end of that four weeks, about half of them were gone. Before and, you even got in a yeah. helicopter? Yeah. Wow. And uh, then, we, then we started to fly. We did, I think, I think uh, you, you had a, a certain amount of hours to solo, and I don't remember exactly what it was. I think it was around 12 or 14 hours uh, of flight time before you soloed. Maybe it was 20. I, I, don't, I don't really remember exactly what it was. Uh, at the end of that time, you had to solo. If you didn't solo, then they set you back, and you had to do that part over again. What so, kind? What helicopter did you learn on? It, it was a uh, Hughes. I believe it was a Hughes three hundred. It was a little, tiny little helicopter. They still they still make one very similar to it now. That's flown by civilians. Did you have yeah. any prior training in the aircraft of any kind? Did you fly before you were in the service? Not not helicopters, fixed wing. You had flown fixed wing? Yeah. My, well, my, uh, well, he, he was not my brother-in-law at the time, he was my friend. Uh, he, he actually had his pilot's license about the time he got out of high school. And I used to go flying with him pretty regularly. And he let me fly once in a while. So I kind of had an idea. Plus I, ever since I was a little kid, I always wanted to fly. You know, I mean, other, other kids were reading whatever they read, and I used to write, read books on flying and shooting and hunting and fishing. <laughs> so I, w I was ready. Yeah. So I take it you soloed with no problem? And yeah. Went I, to the next phase. After you yeah. soloed, what happened? Uh, a after we soloed, then we, we continued to fly on, our, on a regular basis. And there was also a lot of classroom stuff and it was a very the classroom teaching was a very army specific type of teaching where you sort of were uh, self-motivated you read you read these books and answered the questions and if it if it took you an hour to read it that's fine if it took you two hours that was fine too whatever it took so that at the end of each session you you understood what you had read and could answer all the questions and that's the way they did the whole training for the helicopter flight, the flight school. They just kept continuously giving you new books. Was it equal parts of flying and classroom instruction? Uh, well, actually it was probably a little more classroom than flying, but we did fly just about every day. Did you have any physical training at this point or no? No, once we, start, once we started to fly, it was flying and, and school, that's it, every day. When you graduated from Fort Walters, what did you do? The, um, did they we, have a graduation ceremony? Yeah, they did have a graduation ceremony at Fort Walters. Did your family go down? No, they didn't go for that. That was just, that was kind of brief. And, oh, oh, you know, I, I know why they didn't go. Because at the end of Fort Walters, I was told that uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't go home directly. I had to stay there. Uh, and be what they call a super senior to to uh, help with the incoming class. So I stay I stayed there for that. But to what did you have the honor of being a super senior? Uh, probably because I could take a lot of crap. <laughs> <laughs> um, and no, I, I I don't know. They they just they said you and you and you you you're staying here. You're going to be super seniors. You're gonna you're gonna help. 
indoctrinate the incoming class. So they must have figured so, you know what you were doing. I guess. So you stayed there for how much longer being a super senior? A month. Yeah. Stayed there for a month and then, then went to Fort Rucker, Alabama. How long were you at Fort Rucker? Fort Rucker was probably another six months. What kind of training did you do there? Uh, we, we, st we started off uh, actually uh, uh, learning uh, instrument training. Learning what? Instrument training, okay. instrument flight training. Yeah. And th that was that was done in a uh, a bell, a bell helicopter. I, I can't remember the designation of it, but it was like the ones on uh, that on uh, uh, what's the name of the show? Uh, the the Korean the Korean War one. Right. Alan, Alan Alda Mash. Yes, Mash. It was that that kind of a helicopter. But the, the the front of the helicopter was all blacked out, so we never could see the ground. And we had special helmets, so you couldn't even peek out the sides. So you'd actually so go up in the air, like never, and never and never see the ground. They forced you. They forced you to learn how to fly on instruments in a very very short period of time. You, you had no choice. It's easy. That must have been pretty scary. No, it, it wasn't because you always knew the instructor pilot was going to take the controls <laughs> before you before you hit the ground. But they, it, it forced you. It forced you, and, and they didn't have time to mess around. So. It was, they, for, they forced you to learn how to fly instruments real quick. And then once once past that part, then we went into flying the Hueys. Did you fly the Hueys while you were at Fort Rucker? Yes. So this was this now 1968? It, it was, uh, no, now it was 1969. What was the Huey like? What can you tell me about the Huey? Well, by today's by today's standards, it was a piece of junk. <laughs> I mean, it was an antiquated it was an antiquated piece of equipment. They were uh, about at the time. I think they cost about two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Now, uh, a Black Hawk helicopter probably costs ten million, twenty million. I don't even know how much they cost. Um, they were sing single engine uh, when. Uh, when I was at Fort Rucker, I believe we were flying D models, which was an older one. It wasn't quite as powerful, and didn't carry quite as many people, uh, but it was basically basically the same thing. It was probably a thousand horsepower, uh, like homing engine, versus the UH one H, was which I what I flew in uh, Vietnam. We we did get a little bit of time at the end of our training to fly an H model, and that was a little more powerful. A little bigger. Was the instrument panel basically the same? Yeah, the instrument panel was almost almost exactly the same. Did you they, know at the time when you were at Fort Rucker and training in the that you were going to go to Vietnam? Oh yeah, there was no so doubt was about it. You knew ahead of yeah, time. Yeah, there was no doubt about it. After you finished up at Fort Rucker, where did you go? Vietnam. You went directly. Did you get a break and go home in between? Yeah, we we did we did get a break. We went home. When did they tell you where you would be going to in Vietnam? Uh, actually, I didn't know. I didn't know that until I actually got there. Oh, where did so? I I, I went into uh, uh, Cameron. Was it Cameron Bay in Da Nang? Do you recall the month and year? It was. It was either. It was either that. End of end of December, the beginning of January, nineteen seventy. What was your first impression when you landed in Vietnam? It, it, it was, I don't know. It was just a big airport. Kind of hard to tell. I did as I was as I was going in one line. There was some guys going out heading back to the United States, and I saw a guy that I graduated from high school with. You're kidding me. Yeah. You travel halfway across the world and you see somebody from Wallingford, Connecticut? Yep. Yep. I Did see. he give you any words of wisdom? Yeah, he said, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Keep your head down. He, he, had been, he had been in the infantry. When you <laughs> flew to Vietnam, did you go as an individual or as a unit? Uh, no, it was all military flight. Did you go by yourself or had you been put in a, in a crew yet? No, we, I'm um, trying to think, we went to, uh, had to go to uh, Fort Lewis, Washington, 
And from Fort Lewis, Washington, they filled up a stretch DC-8 and everybody went to Vietnam. So once you arrived at the, in the Da Nang airport, where did you go immediately? The, they had a, let's see, how did they do that? They had just sort of a, uh, uh, like a, an introductory thing, you know, welcome to Vietnam. Uh, then from there, oh, I know what they did. They, they gave us, they gave us a wish list. Where would, where would you, where would you prefer to go in Vietnam? And it was about a hundred, a hundred different places, you know, um, some, some of them sounded pretty exotic, and that's what everybody put down first. And one of the last places I really wanted to go was the 101st Airborne Division in i -Corps, and that's where I ended up. Oh, you're kidding. <laughs> yeah, because I knew that was not a good area up there. But, Do you remember what you put down as where you wanted to go? Did you even know what any of those places in Vietnam were? Most, most of them I didn't really know, you know, but there was like, you know, um, a, a, a PX liaison in Saigon, you know, that, that sounded like a good job. <laughs> I didn't get that one. So you got assigned to the 101st Airborne? Right. And, and then we went uh, from Da Nang. We were there probably a day or so. And then we went to, my, I went to the 101st Airborne Division. And there was a, uh, I remember, they had... At, at the time, they had um, they had a, they had a bunch of people. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to remember exactly what they did. There, there was there was an area where everybody coming into the country assembled, and they and they they uh, got you introduced. And the biggest thing that they were trying to introduce everybody to was helicopters, because most of the infantry guys, even though they had a little bit of training in basic and advanced infantry training. It was very minimal, and these guys were really nervous about helicopters. They really didn't really understand them, and they, they were just, you know, there were certain things they had to, had to learn that when they were in the field, stay away from the back, stay away from the tail rotor, and uh, if, you're on, if you're on a hill, stay away, stay, stay away from the uphill side because the blades are gonna be very close to the ground. You know, so that's the kind of stuff that, that they, were, they were told. Um, for me, I, there wasn't a lot for helicopter pilots to do, just get uh, oriented to, to being in country, that's all. Um, Where was 101st located, right in Da Nang? No, no, 101st, uh, oh, were the headquarters? Well, yeah. where you went? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know where headquarters was. Where I was, was in Way, which is an i way up, way up north. Way was the imperial capital. So that's where you were located. Is that where you stayed for your entire time in Vietnam? Yeah, yeah, I was there for the whole year. How big a base was Way? It's pretty big. I mean, probably division size. How many helicopters were there? In the the company, the company that I was in had uh, twenty. Companies had 20 helicopters. They all had 20 helicopters, and there was, uh, you know, I take that I take that back. It wasn't division size, Divi because the division was broken down broken down into about five different locations, so it was like a fifth of a, of a division. What company were you in? Uh, it was Company B of the 101st Assault Helicopter Battalion. When you went, so when you were, when you reported to Way and and you went to that staging area, they they assigned you. They said, "Well, you're going to be in Company B," and told you where to go. Right. Did they assign you to a crew or to a specific helicopter or just to that assault company? No, you you just went to that company and you, you were one of the new guys, and they said, "Okay, tomorrow you're going to go for your initial uh, flight." And you went with a an instructor, and you flew, and you got checked out, make sure make sure that you could actually fly. Um, then then the next day you started your missions. Oh, no honeymoon period. No. What was your check flight like? It was pretty much the same as being in flight school. You know, they just they 
made sure that you could hover and turn around on the ground and do whatever you needed to do. They did a couple of power off landings, stuff like that. Yeah. It, and most people don't realize that if you're going to crash in an aircraft because of engine failure or something, a helicopter is the thing to do it in because the blades will keep turning even if the engine quits. So you, you get one shot at landing the helicopter. It's called an auto-rotation. So yeah. we, we, used to have, we used to have to do those all the time. We didn't usually do them completely 100% to the ground. Usually the instructor pilot would, would turn the engine back on before, before, you, before you got down to the ground. But for the most part, you, you did them almost to the ground. Once in a while, you would do them to the ground. Now, once you got to Vietnam, were you flying the 1Hs? Yeah. Yeah. All right, so your first day in country and you do a check flight, and the yeah. next day you're flying missions? Yep. Yeah. That, that's that's one of the one days that I do remember because on the first day that I that I flew, we flew for 23 hours straight, and the uh, at two at two o'clock in the morning we had tracer rounds going through the going through the doors in the cockpit. <laughs> Welcome to Vietnam! Yeah. Yeah. Holy cow! So I I I, I do remember at, to talking to the pilot that I was with and said, "Is this does this happen every day?" And he goes, "No, usually it's worse." <laughs> I said, oh, that's nice. So when you're, so your second day in country, were you assigned to an already established crew? Did they give you a new crew, or would you fly with different crews? Did you always stay with the same crew members? No, you always the the enlisted guys who were the door gunners and the crew chiefs. They stay with a particular helicopter. That was their responsibility to take care of that helicopter. But the pilots switched back and forth because the the maintenance issues were so great on the helicopters there that you could fly, a, f a helicopter might fly for two days and be down for three. So they, they, you just, you'd be switching all the time. Whatever helicopter and crew was available, that's what you'd go fly. But they, they were all the same, so it didn't really make any difference. So on that first day, um, you were assigned to a new crew, you're taking this helicopter up. What was your mission supposed to be for that day? I don't remember. What kinds of things would, would a typical mission be? What would you do? We did, we did everything. We were, for the most part, we were general support of the 101st Airborne Division, uh, and we supported the infantry people. So we would, we would, we would uh, fly. Resupply was a big part of our mission. We'd fly food, water, ammunition into the guys that were on the ground. Then combat assaults, we go and you'd put guys into landing zones or, or you'd go in and you'd take them out, extract them, one or the other. Um, that, that, that primarily was what we did every day. Did was, you have a, a specific geographic area that you were assigned to? Uh, not, not exactly. I mean, we, we were strictly in I-Corps. I never got, I never got, once I, once I left Denang and went up to Way, I never got back down the south of Da Nang again. The, the only time, the only time I even, even got to Da Nang is one of the things that they made me do. <laughs> they put me in charge of the officers club. So we had, we had, actually had an officers club that we built and somebody had to go once a month to pick up liquor and, and beer because you had ration cards. And so I was, I was in charge of the club. So I would collect all the ration cards and once a month we'd fly down to Da Nang, to the PX, and we'd pick up as much as we could get with the ration cards and then bring it back. That was, that was one of my jobs. That was, so that, that's the only time I ever got back down to Da Nang again. Wow. So it, your typical the, missions were some, it could be anywhere in the i Corps area. Yeah, we, we, we went from well, just a little bit south of Way all the way up to the DMZ. The, the, there, was another, there was another company that was between us and the DMZ, so they got most of that stuff. But we uh, we did we also did uh, uh, general support. We did direct, general support and direct support. And sometimes when we did direct support, we would actually have to uh, fly into North Vietnam and Laos. We did we did that from time to time too. You did. Yeah. Did you know ahead of time that that's what you'd be doing? Oh yeah. What were your instructions? 
I, it would it depend it depend on what you were doing. Usually we'd be putting um, mercenaries in. A lot of it was mercenaries. How many times would you say you crossed the border into either North Vietnam or Laos? Twenty times maybe. And what if you guys shut down in Laos? What were you supposed to do? Since we weren't supposed to be there. Uh, good luck. <laughs> You're in trouble. Did you ever have any problems when you were flying in either North Vietnam or Laos? No. No. Well, the, 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 the biggest problem we ever had once is coming back. We couldn't get back because of the weather. And we ended up running out of fuel. And luck, luckily, we were up high enough, and, the, and we came down through the clouds, and the, there was a landing strip there. We did our, our rotation out to the landing strip. So you were coming back from where? Laos. And you ran into bad weather? Yeah. What was that like in a helicopter? Well, it was, you, you had to fly around it. You couldn't fly through it. I mean, you fly through a thunderstorm in, a, in those helicopters, they ripped the blades off. So you couldn't, you couldn't do that. You had to go around it or over it somehow. So what did you do? Try to go around luckily, it? Luckily, that one, they weren't that high. We got over them. Because those helicopters would only fly about 10, 12,000 feet. That was it, as high as you could get. When you realized you weren't going to make it back to Wade, that you didn't have enough fuel, what no, we, we weren't. That that was we weren't going to Way at that time. We were going to some fire base out in the middle of nowhere. I don't even remember the name of it. But so when you knew you weren't going to make it there, what did you do? Say, well, hope hope we see something before we get the ground. <laughs> so you, I mean, you're like on empty, and and you're looking for some place to land. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you just so what did you find? We br well, we came, we came down, we came down through the clouds, and we got under the clouds. And as we were getting under the clouds, we saw the runway up ahead, and we just just made it to the runway. Well, what were you thinking at that time? Because what if that runway wasn't there when you came out of those clouds? You just landed in the jungle someplace. It, it, when when that kind of stuff happens, you really didn't think about it. You know, it was, you just didn't think about it. It's just something that you did. You did it all the time. You know, the, in, in Vietnam, the, the, the first three months you're there, all you're, wor you're worried that you're going to get hurt, you're going to get killed. And then after three months of it, you forget all about it. Then in the next six months, you just, you don't even think about it. You just do what you have to do. Then the last three months, then you start thinking about it again. Say, so, geez, you know, I might get out of here. Then you start getting nervous. And that's usually when people had, their biggest problems is when they started getting short because they start thinking about it too much. At the beginning, you said that first day of your actual flying, you were 23 hours in the air. Do you recall the mission and what you were supposed to do and what happened and why it was you spent 23 hours in the air? Was there a problem or was that typical? No, there was, it was that, that was an unusual day. Usually we didn't fly that much. And we, we didn't fly a lot at night The whole because they're... Uh, it was so hard to find your way around there. They didn't really have uh, a lot of electronic stuff to, to help you find your way around. And at night, it was black. And, it, and if it was cloudy out or something, forget it. You, just, you couldn't see anything. So you didn't really do a lot of flying at night. Um, sometimes you do flare missions and stuff. But like that first day we flew, I don't really remember exactly what we did, but it was just a lot of stuff. It was probably, probably did a half a dozen different missions in one day. Because you can only fly for like two hours and you have to refuel. So you fly for two hours, you refuel, keep, get, you know, get back in, go someplace else, maybe go over and pick up some supplies, deliver them to somebody, and then somebody's in trouble, so you go over there and you pick them up and you get them out. So, I mean, a number of things can happen in, in any one given day. So every time you'd have to go back to refuel, you'd go back to your base that way, refuel? Not necessarily. So, sometimes there were other POLs, that, you know, the... the gas stations, so to speak. And you go, you just go to the nearest one. How did one. you know where the nearest one was? You just knew. <laughs> well, I mean, we, I mean, everybody, everybody that flew had to be good at reading maps. So most of the time, to this day, when I read maps, I just memorize them. Really? So I can, I can usually just look at the, look at the map for 10 minutes and then just go there. That's, that's the way we used to do it. So, because, I mean, when, once you first arrived in the country, you didn't know what square inch of Vietnam. Right. 
that you would quickly learn? Well, I had, I had, I had seen maps bef before, when we were in flight school. There was a lot of map reading stuff, which I, you know, I, I, already, I already knew how to read maps, but uh, they were, it was more in-depth, and a lot of it was maps of Vietnam. Not necessarily where I was, but they, they, it's kind of all the same. They, there are topographic maps, and you would you would take your own you you'd have your own set of maps and you'd mark the landing zones and certain mountain tops and most of the most of the hills were were called like Hill Eight Fourteen and if you look at the map it's got the alt the altitude above sea level is Eight Fourteen so that's Hill Eight Fourteen or landing zone Eight Fourteen and then you can always find it <laughs> on the map. Once you became familiar with the, the territory, especially up in, in I Corps, did you know it by heart then? So if they said go to the XYZ or Hill whatever, you could go right there? Yeah, mo most, most, most of the places that you went to on a regular basis, you didn't even have to look at the map, you just knew how to get there. Because we went, there was a lot of fire bases, and we went to the same fire bases. There was probably 25 fire bases within flying distance of us, and we would go to go to those fire bases all the time, either for resupply, uh, put guys in, take guys out. Um, usually, very very seldom did we ever pick up any wounded. That was the medevac ships. That's what they did. They picked up wounded people. We did. Sometimes we did. You know. Um, so I I remember, I remember once I had a pick up a wounded guy and bring him out to the hospital ship, which is just offshore, because we weren't that far from the ocean where we were. And uh, they, load, they loaded the guy in, and I went out to the hospital ship, and it was a little rough out there, and I landed, landed on the, there was a helipad in the back, and I landed on the helipad in the back, and the guys came out, and they took the guy, took the guy out and stuff, and probably within 30 seconds, I got seasick. <laughs> just from landing. Yeah, and, and here we, I mean, just flew every day, constantly. But it's just and that it, different motion. That different motion. Got instantly seasick. <laughs> and I said, can I leave now? <laughs> As the pilot of the Huey, what was your responsibility? Well, it, it depended whether you were the pilot or the co-pilot. You, you served both roles? Right. When you, first, when you first started flying, you were co-pilot for probably three months or so. And then you, when they when they thought you were ready, then they gave you your own helicopter and, a, and your own and your own co-pilot. Then your your pilot, you were uh, um, aircraft commander, and you and you flew left seat versus right seat because there was a difference. So the right seat is the co-pilot. The right seat was the co-pilot. Did you have the same pilot when you were your, the co-pilot? Was it? Did you always fly with the same pilot? No. So every no. day could be every somebody day could be somebody different. Yeah. When you became the pilot and flew the right seat or the left seat, again you could have a different co-pilot every day. Right. So you were never with the same crew. Were you ever with the same individual, or was it always different? No, I mean, well, there was, there was, uh, we probably had um, 30 or so pilots in the company. Uh, probably, yeah, it's probably around 30 pilots in the, in the company at, at any one time. And, and guys were constantly coming and going. So you, you never knew really who you were going to fly with. Was it a small enough company where you got to know each oh, yeah, you, other? So yeah. you were close enough that you knew the other pilots? Right, yeah. Every, everybody, everybody knew each other. Um, people, people had a tendency not to make real close friends. Why was that? Because you didn't know, you didn't know if the, the guy you were going to be friends with was going to be dead the next day. So it probably wasn't. You know, people just didn't make real close friends. How big a crew would fly a Huey? Four guys: the door gunner, crew chief, who were enlisted guys, and the pilot and co-pilot. And we could we could carry uh, depend depend depending on the weather uh, about six Americans with all their stuff, or uh, probably ten Vietnamese. Uh, for one thing, the Viet the Vietnamese they they tended to carry a lot less gear because they they were the Vietnamese 
army. They they were almost like National Guard, you know. They 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 didn't all live in barracks and stuff like regular army in, in a combat situation because they were on their own turf. That was their their backyard. So a lot of them they would go out for two or three days in the field, do what they had to do, and they go home. They go back to their wife and kids. They were in some hut someplace outside in in uh, well. Way it was way, and, and another town was Fubai, which was right next to it. Um, but that's where these guys lived. And then they would they would come in and um, do do what they had to do. They go out and fly. They go out for a combat assault. They spend spend a few days in the field, and then they come back. So they travel light compared to the Americans. What kind of armament did you have on you? Uh, whatever we had for our personal sidearms and two M60 machine guns. That was it? Yeah. The, the, door, the door gunner and the crew chief handled those in the back. And the, uh, the door gunner, that, that was the door gunner's sole responsibility is to take care of those guns. And we would, we would always check to make sure that they were clean and everything was, everything was right. Because uh, the, the guys a lot of times smoked a lot of dope. So if they were smoking dope and drinking and their guns were dirty, Hit the road, get somebody else. We wouldn't go up with them. Well, your life was depending on it. Um, what did you have to do as a pilot to prepare for your flight? We did. We did a, a pre-flight in the morning, um, and that was that was really about all we did. All, all the maintenance and, and everything was all taken care of by somebody else. The uh, the crew chief usually did his own pre-flight. And then the, the crew, the pilot and the co-pilot would come out and we'd do like a secondary pre-flight basically to go over the stuff that he already went over. Is it, one, one thing about flying is there's checklists and there's procedure and you do the same thing over and over and over again so that you don't, you don't make a mistake, you don't miss something. So that's, everybody kind of backed everybody up, checked, checked each other's work. Do you recall any specific missions that you flew that were memorable? Well, I, I, I do I do remember one that was uh, particularly a bad day. <laughs> um, they it was uh, I think it was during the Tet Offensive. I'm I'm not sure, um, but the, a fire base had been overrun and. Uh, it was called, the name was called Tung Tavern. And Tung? T, yeah, it was like T-U-N-G. And I don't know what it, what it meant. But yeah. it, was, it was a fire base out in the middle of no place. It was right on the edge of the Ashaw Valley. That's, that was part of our territory. And uh, we lost like 23 helicopters that, that day. Got, 23 helicopters in one got, day? Either, either got shot up or shot down, yeah. In one day, a lot of shooting going on. <laughs> I guess were you in the middle of the shooting? Were they shooting at you also? Oh yeah, yep. I I, I almost got it there. They they were uh, shooting uh, mortars into the LZ, and what they were doing is they were as the helicopters were landing, they were trying to time it so that when one helicopter took off, the next one landed. They put their mortar in the tube, and it would hit just about the time the helicopter landed. So. We realized that right away because they sit there, you know, guys were on the radio. They said they're timing us, they're timing us, you know. So I was behind somebody and I came in and I was on short final and I said, okay, when I was like really close to the ground, I said, okay, I'm, make, I'm making a go around because they're, they're loading their tubes now. And I veered, off, I veered off to the side, about five or six mortars hit the, hit the LZ and just did a 360 and came in and landed. And got got the guys off and then got out of there. But, so all so how so do did you fly, uh, fly in formation? So, yeah, What's some, a helicopter sometimes. formation. Like how many helicopters go in a group? As many as many as you want. You could you could have no typical. No, you could have you could have a combat assault with like three helicopters, or you could have one with thirty or forty or fifty. So on this particular day, when you lost twenty three, like how many helicopters did you start? Oh, with? there was well over fifty. It was it was a big combat assault. And were you all just going in and dropping men off? Yeah, we were just dropping them off. We we're picking anybody up. 
So what's going on in your mind as a pilot? You know you're flying into fire, um, and that they're trying to shoot you down. So as a pilot, what were you thinking? Don't get hit. <laughs> Did your training automatically kick all in at the, you know, and do you just do things like that on automatic? Yeah. Yeah, you, you really did. Like I was saying, the first three months you worry about everything. The next six months, it's like, you know, just do, do your job and hope you don't get hit. So. Well, that was a pretty memorable day. Yeah, that was, that was an interesting day. Then another one, I, I, I never liked dogs. And some guys, the guys got on with a German Shepherd that was, uh, you know, they were, they're heading out to the field with the, with the canine unit. And the dog, we had, there was a switch there. It was, it was your main fuel switch. And what you had to do is you had to pull it up and then back to shut the main fuel off. So I'm in there and the dog was supposed to have a muzzle on and he didn't have a muzzle on. And he put his foot up there and it was right on the main fuel. And all I could think of is he's going to pull his foot up and shut that main fuel off. So I reached over to grab his paw and he clamped down, he clamped down on my arm and I start yelling at the, at the handler. I was ready to shoot him. And uh, so he grabbed, he, grabbed, he grabbed the dog and got the dog off. But it's like, that it's was, that was scary. No, he didn't bite me. He just grabbed me, yeah. grabbed me and held on. You know, I said that, that was, that was, that was not a good day either. I still don't like dogs particularly. <laughs> Do you recall any other specific missions that were memorable? A uh, couple, couple, couple in in Laos that were pretty scary. Um, Can you uh, give me a little bit of a description? Um, the, the, those those were those were missions where you you'd take guys out and some some of the times you'd actually go out and find the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and then t take these guys and insert them. Like I said, most, most of them were mercenaries. And you insert them on, along the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and they go in there usually for a body snatch where they could grab somebody from the North Vietnamese Army, and then they'd get to an LZ or get to a spot someplace where you could pick them up and haul them right, haul them right back out. Um, that, that, that used to happen from time to time. That got pretty scary. <laughs> Um, when you would drop them in, how many people would be in the team that you'd drop in? Just probably four or five. And then would you have to fly around waiting, or would you go back? Depend depends what they were doing. You know, I mean, sometimes sometimes you go in and you pick the wrong spot to land, and you know it's kind of hard to disguise a helicopter's noise. You know, you can hear the things from miles away, and uh, a couple of times we, we went into these places and the North Vietnamese who were actually sitting there waiting for us, and they'd wait till the first two ships got in. If if it was you know depending on how many you had, usually those things had like four or five ships, and they wait for the first two to get in, and then the third one would come in. They start shooting at you, and then now you had now you had a problem because now you got guys on the ground, and you got maybe a dozen or so guys shooting at you, and then I mean they're close. I mean you could look you could, you could look out the window and see them, and. So then, what, what usually what would happen is then they start shooting at the guys on the ground. Then they'd have wounded. So now you got to turn around and get everybody out. So those those were bad days. <laughs> what would a typical day be like? Like what time would you get up? What would you do? When would you get back? You get get up at the crack of dawn, and go you go go get your assignment. For whatever whatever needed to be done, and there there usually be at least ten ships a day would would take off at the same pretty much the same time. Um, again, it, a lot of it depended on your maintenance. Whether you know sometimes they couldn't get the parts, and you'd have a bunch of ships down, and so it was you know it'd be it'd be at least 10, 10 to 15, 10, 12, 15 ships a day would take off and go do different things. So you'd get up, you know, like I said, you get up at the crack of dawn, you'd go for a, a briefing. They tell you what needed to be done, who was going where, and you'd go out. And by, by the time you got there, the crew chief and door gunner were already at the aircraft, and the crew chief would already have done his, 
pre-flight and then you go and you do your pre-flight and then you get in and just go fly for whatever whatever needed to be done. So you might fly anywhere from a few hours a day uh, to 8, 10, 12, depending, depending on the day. We were limited as to how many hours we could fly in a month. Uh, I think it was 130. I think and did I, you abide by that? Oh yeah, no, they, they, they grounded you after, after so many hours. As far as flying, would you fly a certain number of days and then have time off, or was it fly a certain number of hours and have time off? No, was you it just sporadic. It would, there, there, there really, there really was no such thing as time off. You flew seven days a week. If you know, there, there was no Saturdays or Sundays. It, you, you flew seven days a week. Like I said, the, the only limiting factor is that you couldn't fly over 130 hours, and I, I think. I think it was 130, it might have been 120, I'm not sure, I don't remember exactly, but you were limited as to how many, and then they ground you for a couple of days, you couldn't fly for a couple of days, and uh, they'd make you do something else, and then, you, then you'd get back into the cycle again, start over again. Do you know how many hours you flew while you were in the country? Um, right around 1,000. It's actually, I think it's on my paperwork, yeah. Well. Because I, I, had, I had broken my arm how did that I, be, I believe it was August. August uh, of 70? Yeah. What happened? Yeah, I, there was a, a rocket attack, and I went from my bunk out the door, and it had rained, and we just had like a like a deck that, that was up raised up over the, the bunker, and I did a half gainer off the, the deck and came down and put my arms out in front of me, and this arm just went... Right back, we jumped in the in the in the uh, bunker, and I took my arm and I straightened it out. And I said, "I think I broke my arm." And uh, and that was your right arm. Yeah, you and right I'm not right-handed. Yeah, so we get we got out of there, and the things really started throbbing and swelling up. I said, "Yeah, I got a problem." But we didn't have any doctors where we were, so we just had a medic. So, so what did you do? He he looked at it and he goes, well, I don't know what to tell you. So I put an ace bandage on it and give you some give me some aspirin. He said, you got to go over to the doc the the, uh, the the hospital in Fubai tomorrow. So the next the next day, drove drove over to Fubai and they X-rayed it and they said, oh yeah, you broke it pretty bad. And uh, the uh, he said what we have to do is we have to because now it had been almost twenty four hours later. By the time I finally got to see a doctor, and uh, he said we got to take it. So they had it like this, and he and he said you need to you need to flip it over. And I said okay, so I could I couldn't do it. He he just grabbed it and twisted it and passed out. <laughs> so they put a, they put a cast on it from fingertip to shoulder. So that I had that on for six weeks. Where did you spend that six weeks? In uh, the operations center, as a as a liaison between our company and I think it was brigade, brigade or battalion. What could you do with just your one? Wrote left-handed. <laughs> so did you learn to become to, ambidextrous? To, no, no, not too good, but you could read it. <laughs> uh, wow. A lot of it was a lot of it was radio contact anyway. Could still talk on the radio. Did you sustain any other injuries while you were in Vietnam? No. Were you awarded any medals or citations? Yes. <laughs> I know you were. I, Do you recall which ones? Yeah, I, we we were just we were just looking at them back there. But um, I know I got a bronze star, but I don't, I don't remember what it was for. I got twenty-seven air medals. I got an air medal. For valor, um, there was a um, a Vietnam. There was something with the Vietnam that had two gold stars on it, which we still haven't figured out what that was for. Um, Do you recall any specific incidents that for, for which you got those medals? No, I, I just don't recall. I mean, f for one thing, in the in the hundred first Airborne Division, they were not really too anxious to give out medals. You, you really, you really, they, 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 they didn't, like, they didn't give Purple Hearts. I mean, technically, I suppose I 
broke my wrist during a rocket attack. I probably should have got a Purple Heart for that, but there was no way that they were going to write that up as a Purple Heart thing. So it was just like I didn't care. And we'll attach the paperwork um, to this record with all your medals and citations are in there. You've got a unit citation also. I'm going to switch gears for a little bit and talk about the daily life. When you were in at the base at Wei, and that's where you spent your entire time in Vietnam, were you there for an entire year? Just about, yeah. What was the sleeping arrangement? Did you have like barracks? Yep, yeah, we, we had a barracks that actually the some of the guys from bef before I was there had actually built. They built the barracks, um, so that was that was nice. Um, we had two guys, two guys to a room. The rooms were twelve by fourteen, maybe something like that. You know, all op open open air. I mean, they had they had screens on the on the windows and stuff, so keep some of the bugs out. So you had beds. Yeah, we had regular bunk beds. Um, Again, all this stuff was all made by uh, the pe the people who had been there before me. We had we had an officers' club, which was a like a, an A-frame building. Which uh, what, when I when I was there, one of the things I did is I got it air conditioned. I trade I traded some stuff uh, to the uh, Air Force because the Air Force Air Force had a lot of air conditioners because of the, their towers. All the all the the towers and everything uh, had a lot of electronic equipment they needed to keep it cool, so they had air conditioning. And I, what they didn't, what they didn't have is stuff from the field, especially uh, enemy guns and stuff. So that I talked to some guys that I that I knew, and I said, "Look, if you can get us a bunch of guns and stuff, we'll give you an air conditioner." I said, "Okay." So we just went, gave them like a truckload of stuff, and they gave us an air conditioner, regular like a regular like today you'd call it a rooftop unit. But it was big enough to do this whole club, which was it was pretty good sized building. I mean, one of the other things I did when I was there is got a, a mezzanine in it. So it was, you know, it was like twenty five feet high. It was a good sized building. We put in a mezzanine, we put in a fireplace. In the in the winter, in the winter, in the rainy season, it did get kind of miserable. You know. But the temperature never got much below sixty. But at there it was cold. Cold and miserable and rainy. How did you stay in touch with your family while you were over there? You wrote letters. Were you a good letter writer? No, not at all. <laughs> Do you have any letters from... No, I doubt it. What was the food like? Did you have a regular mess hall? We had a regular mess hall. Sometimes they actually had food, sometimes they didn't. <laughs> sometimes we had we ate sea rations. Because they, they just, you know, they run out. You know. What was so, included in a sea ration? It depends. There was like, f I think, five different kinds. You know, they had like, uh, they had a, uh, like a, sc a scrambled egg omelet type thing. And then they had like spaghetti and meatballs. Um, they had like a beef stew and a chicken stew. I think that's it. That's like, I think that's five. Um, and then it came with, it came with little, some, some toilet paper and some cigarettes and some gum and a little thing for uh, like a dessert, some kind of little cake or something in a tin can. Uh, they, they were, I mean, I, I have never been a fussy eater, so I didn't care. It, did, it didn't make any difference to me. That's like, yeah, that's, that's cool. I can eat that. Um, once in a while, we'd get what they call lerp rations from the guys who were uh, special forces and stuff. They, that was a, a dehydrated food, it wasn't in cans, it was very very much lighter. All they had to do was add water to it and it would swell up and make food out of it. And that stuff actually tasted pretty good, but it was hard to get. But sometimes we could make a deal and we could get that. Um, one of the other things that I used to be able to do is, I, I knew a friend of mine was in the, the Navy and he happened to be there at the same the same time I was, but he, he, was, he was more down at Da Nang. But every once in a while he would come up in his the ship that he was in, which was really like a landing craft. And uh, he put me in touch with some guys that, were, that lived on a barge out in, in the bay near where we were stationed. And they had no way really of getting mail because their mail 
came from Da Nang. So they they would go a month at a time with no mail. So once in a, every once in a while, if I was going down to Da Nang, I'd call them up on the radio and say, I'm going to Da Nang, can I get your mail and stuff? And say, oh yeah. So we go down, we get out to Da Nang, we pick up all the stuff, we pick up their mail and everything. We come back, we land on their barge and they would give us steaks and chicken and shrimp and lobster. They had everything. They, they give, they give it to us, they trade us. That was a good trade. Yeah, so then we go back and have a barbecue. When you did have food at the mess hall, did you have three meals a day? Oh yeah, yeah. You you, you never you never went hungry. Were there ever any shortages of anything, any supplies or ammunition? Not really. Um, the the biggest the biggest shortage we had was was helicopter parts. They couldn't keep up with the helicopter parts. These things would break down so fast. Because of uh, combat, or because of just regular wear and tear? Just mostly just wear and tear. Did you feel pressure or stress? Uh, you mean because of the combat? Yeah. Not really. I kind of liked it. <laughs> One of those adrenaline junkies <laughs> gets in your blood. Was there anything special that you did for good luck? Not really. I had, my, my call sign was 13 because nobody else would take it. <laughs> Joe's call sign 13? Yeah. I was also born on the 13th. I was, I was 13 on Friday the 13th. So it's like, eh, hey, can't be that unlucky. <laughs> so your number was 13. What was the name of the uh, unit that you were in? The Kingsman. Kingsman? Yeah. Did you have a calling card you left? Yep. When you weren't flying, what did you do for entertainment? Um, <clears throat> we had we had uh, music. Everybody had uh, tape recorders and radios and stuff like that. So we had we had plenty of music. Uh, they did they did have uh, USO shows from time to time. Did you see any USO shows? Oh yeah, yeah. Do you recall any specific? Not, not really. I mean, they were pretty generalized. You know, I, I mean, I, I never got to go to the Bob Hope show. You know, <laughs> but he, 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 had, he was there. He had been there. He was there a couple times when I was there, but we, we weren't. We didn't get him. He, he would have to go to a real secure area, and we weren't really that secure. Because uh, we we get we get rocket attacks on a regular basis. How regular? Yeah, probably a couple three times a week. So oh, right. yeah, so we we weren't a real secure area, <clears throat> so we we didn't get people like that to come where we were. What other kinds of things did you do for entertainment? That was about it. Did you have a chance for any R and R or leave while you were in the country? Yeah, I, I did. I did go to uh, Hong Kong for a week. For a week? Yeah. What did you do there? Guess. Or... <laughs> <laughs> Had fun. <laughs> and then you uh, then you went back. How was it going back into combat after you'd been away from it for a week? Um, at, at, at that point, I was getting to the point where I was starting to get short and that's, it was right after, right after I got back from Hong Kong is when I broke my arm. Okay. So then I went six weeks. So then by then I was, I, once I started to fly again, I had less than two months to, 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 to stay. And, um, the first time, the first time I flew after they took the cast off. Uh, we had a, uh, a hurricane, a typhoon was coming, and we had to move the helicopters from where we were up farther north. And so they said, okay, well, we got to take everything out of here that'll fly. Uh, you're going you're to have to fly. And I said, I can't fly. I couldn't even use my hand. And they said, well, we'll give you a good co pilot. I said, way to go. <laughs> so off we went. We flew up north. And how could you fly without your right hand? Not very well. Luckily, I didn't really have to. They gave they, the co-pilot did all the flying. 
I, I probably could have if I had to, you know, but it, it just wasn't working very good at the time. What was your opinion of your fellow officers? Um, good. I like, you know, everybody, everybody was well-trained and well-disciplined and, uh, everybody did what they were supposed to do. I mean, we had, we had a lot of warrant officers, so the, the warrant officers, uh, for the most part, did not have any other command responsibilities. They, they just flew. That, that, that's, all, that's all most of them did. And we had some lieutenants and captains who were uh, squad commanders and stuff, and they, they also flew. But you know, everybody, everybody was, was pretty good. I, there, there wasn't anybody uh, in our direct company that I had any problems with. And it was, you know, we, you, you, ha you had to get along with everybody. What was your opinion of the enlisted men? Uh, about the same. No problems for the most part. You all got along. Yeah, for the mo for the most part, everybody got along because the, the enlisted men, especially the ones that flew, were counting on you to make sure that they got back safe. So they didn't want they didn't want to they didn't want to make too many enemies. <laughs> Did you form any close relationships while you were over there? No. Anybody that you stayed in touch with after the war? Uh, just one one guy um, was actually he was my roommate. Um, I, well, I actually I had had a couple of uh, roommates. Um, the uh, um, the the well, see the the first the first roommate I had he left, he he, he got out of country. Uh, then the second the second roommate he he was he was an artist. And he had, he ended up he ended up moving into another room with somebody else who he was more friendly with, but we were still friendly. Um, and then I got another guy who was at the time turned out to be the youngest guy who ever made it through flight school because he lied about his age, and he was in Vietnam. He was still seventeen years old, oh flying helicopters, and. Uh, he was generally crazy. He, he's dead now. He didn't die there, but he died after he came home in a car accident. But he was, he was nuts. <laughs> and is that the one fellow that you did stay in touch with? After? No, it was actually the, the first guy, the artist. He, he, he's, the, he's the one I talked to afterwards. And, we and went. are you still in touch with him? No, I haven't talked to him in years. Years and years. We took a trip. We took a trip after we got out. And because uh, he, he got he got out about a month or so after I did, and I got I got in touch with him, and he uh, he was from Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania, Punxsutawney Phil, yeah, and, yeah. Yeah. and uh, I, I talked to him and I said you know you, you want to take a trip someplace and he goes yeah I got to get out of here, so we we went and we took uh, I don't know we were gone for a month or so, a month and a half. What was to, his name? Um. Yeah, buckshot. <laughs> yeah, uh, you had to ask that. I'm terrible. I'm terrible. Oh. Terrible at names. Well, I'm um, sorry. If you think of it. Yeah, name. I just everybody just called him buckshot. Buckshot. <laughs> yeah. Did you keep a journal or a diary or anything like that while you were over there? No, nothing. And I know you do have a lot of pictures of this one. Yeah. Um, so when when you got back from your R and R and you said you had about two months left, you're on short time. What, how was it different when you were on short time? Did you keep one of those short timer calendars? No. No, it was uh, well. Right, right after I got back is when I broke my arm, so I was out for six weeks, and then after that six weeks, I had less than two months to go, and I was really a short timer. But I didn't. I don't know. I didn't really think about it that much. We we were also at the time in the in the midst of Vietnamization, where they were trying to get the Vietnamese army to take over, and they they weren't too good <laughs> to say the least, because um, they they had their own pilots. But we were giving them aircraft, and they they were so they were starting to fly missions themselves, uh, but they they just kind of couldn't get it. I mean, 
to, to get into the POL to get fuel, there was a, a there's a there's a certain pattern that you, that you flew. You know, you went over certain points and, and you did did what you had to do, and then they clear you to land, and you go in and you land. These guys would just come flying up up the highway, and they'd say, "I come now, I come now. I need fuel, I need fuel," and they'd be like on their twenty minute warning light, and they would they would just come barging in and land, <laughs> refuel. What does PLL stand for? Uh, POL. POL um, uh, petroleum O something. Oh, so <laughs> it's, 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 it's where it's they kept the fuel. Stop. Yeah, fuel stop. I don't remember exactly what it stood for. Petroleum something. Do you recall your last day in Vietnam? No. Don't remember. Do you remember what it was like flying out and leaving? Um, no, only, <laughs> only when I got to Chicago, um, you, you saw my uniform there. That's all I had on. Now, I, I had been someplace where it was not unusual to be a hundred degrees every day. That, that's the only uniform I had. That's all I had. No jacket, nothing. We came into, uh, uh Fort Lewis, Washington. I was there for a day or so. Was a military flight? Or yeah, no, it was, it was a military flight. Um, so they're from Fort, Fort Lewis, Washington. At the time, they gave me the option to either volunteer to stay in indefinitely or get out. And if I, if, if I volunteered to stay indefinitely within 60 days, I'd be back in Vietnam. If I uh, said I wanted to get out, I owed them another uh, four years in the National Guard back in Connecticut. So I said, I'll take my chances with the National Guard. So I, ca I came back to Connecticut as we flew from from uh, Washington, we were supposed to fly nonstop to Boston or New York, one or the other, I forget which. Uh, but the there was a weather issue, so we landed in Chicago. We stayed there for I don't know how many hours, and then they, they finally said, "Okay, we're going to get on a different plane, and we're going to we're going we're gonna to send you to Boston." I said, "Okay," so we got on the plane. And as we were taking off, they were having hydraulic problems, because because I could I could hear the I could hear the hydraulics going on and off, on and off. They said oh, they got a problem, and they kept circ they kept circling the the airport. And I said something's wrong. So some woman was sitting next to me, and she was why why are we why are we going around in circles around the airport? And I said oh well you know they're just like getting ready to to, to go. Everything's gonna be okay. And finally they finally they did they took off, and off we went to. To Boston, and <clears throat> it was it was it was right around Christmas. It was winter time, and we were flying. And they said, uh, "Well, we ha we have a problem. We can't land in Boston because of the weather. We're going to land in Hartford." So I said, "Oh, good." <laughs> so they land they landed at Bradley Field, and they said, "Okay, we're going to have a bus come out to take the people off the off the plane because it was snowing at Bradley Field too." And they said, "We're going to get the people off the." the uh, plane, get them on a bus and ship them up to uh, uh, Boston. So I said, I don't want to go to Boston. I live in Connecticut. I want to get off here. And so it took, it took like another hour for them to finally come out and get the people off. But from there, I went into uh, the, the airport and nobody knew I was coming home. And I, I started calling home, couldn't get anybody. I finally got my brother-in-law and I said, I'm up in Bradley Field. Can you come and pick me up? So he said, "Yeah, I'll come and pick you up." But, well, that must have been a nice surprise for your family. Yeah, yeah, that was nice. So that was around Christmas time. Would that have been 1970 or 71? 70. 70. Yeah. What was your homecoming like when you finally did get home? Your family saw you and uh, your friends and neighbors. Well, <laughs> one one of the things I had done because my mother knew I was getting short. And I said to her, do not put it in the newspaper that I'm coming home. Well, she did anyway. Right after, she, she had it timed. And like the next day after I got there, there was an article in the newspaper. That's when the people started calling up and saying, you baby killer. And why don't you go back and get yourself killed? And You're yeah, it was, it was nasty. People called your home and said those things? Yeah. They talked to you in person? Yeah, some of them did. What were you thinking? When you're hearing this kind of stuff after you just served a year in the country. Well, I didn't have very nice things to say to them. <laughs> but. 
So now you're home on leave. That was common at the time. That was common at the time. But now you owe four years to the National Guard. Yeah. So what did so what did you have to do to uh I uh, contacted the National Guard and they said, We're full up, we don't need you. Give us your name, send us send us your paperwork, and if we need you we'll call you. And I didn't hear from them for five years. And my wife was going to school. She had just graduated. Uh, she was she had gotten a job, and I wanted to go back and take care take advantage of the GI Bill. And I got into Yukon, so I was I was heading back to Yukon, and that was like in September of seventy uh, five. Yeah, September of seventy five. Um, I had been working for a jewelry company, but she. Uh, she had, she had she had finished up and they called and they said we need we need uh, some pilots are you interested and I said well so I said it's been almost five years since I flew and they said it doesn't matter they said if you want if you want come on up I said yeah I need the money I'm going to school so I went and uh, signed up and was in the National Guard for another three years at least um, then finally did you fly helicopter oh yeah yeah that's what, what I did you, what kind of missions would you fly at? It was mostly practice stuff, you know. Right Fruit. in the state of Connecticut. No, we used to we used to go to uh, used to fly to Logan a lot, have lunch, come back, um, fly up fly up to Albany, fly fly to different places in New York. As a National Guardsman, what was your commitment to them? Uh, none. I had I had no commitment. I could stay as long as I wanted. I could leave any time, and uh, in 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 the meantime. My uh, my wife's brother, who was also a pilot, he flew commercially. He was in a an airplane crash and had a traumatic brain injury. So um, that hap that happened in '75, right right after I went into uh, the Yukon. Uh, so that was a big family problem for for a long period of time. And then in I think it was it was either '78 or '79. Uh, I, I was in a helicopter crash in uh, Bradley Field. You were? Yeah. What and, happened? Uh, we blew blew a oil pump through the side of the motor on takeoff. So nobody got hurt. So we we kind of hurt the we kind of hurt the helicopter a little bit. But well, <laughs> did you have to do that auto rotation thing, or you never even got? No, we we didn't, no we, we we didn't we didn't really have time as we were uh, as we were coming down. The engine was still running. We thought we were going to make it to the ground, and like 100 feet above the ground, the engine quit. So we kind of had a hard landing and spread the skids and banged the thing up a little. So you um, basically dropped like a rock. Yeah, for that last 100 feet or so. Um, but everybody everybody walked away from it okay. Actually, we were, we were flying Ella Grasso's luggage, because Ella Grasso was the governor at the time, and she loved helicopters. She loved them. She was in them all the time. And they, they had a... Uh, Governor's Conference at Albany, and there was, I think, three or four helicopters who were flying all the dignitaries, and we were the last ones, we were flying the luggage. So, the when the when the uh, pump blew, it blew a hole through the side of the fuselage into, into the cabin, and all the synthetic oil, which really, it doesn't really burn, but it, uh, it discolors and smells terrible when it's gets subjected to high heat and it got all over their luggage. It was just covered with it. And uh, the stink, it's like, oh my God, these people are gonna go nuts. So they said, oh, you gotta get that, you gotta get that stuff up there. So they said, okay, you got another, you got another helicopter? And they said, yeah. So we took the stuff, we put it in the other helicopter, we flew it up there. And then we came back and when he came back, oh, well, everybody got in trouble. Cause we, it was, it was, a, it was a forced landing. We were supposed to be debriefed and we're supposed to go. We're not supposed to fly until you get cleared medically. And then, so, the the guy who was running the National Guard, he got in trouble. Everybody got in trouble for that one. <laughs> but it was it was right after that. My wife kind of was really nervous. So I said, you know what, it's time for me to get out. So I got out. Now, when did you find time to get married? Um, nineteen seventy two. After I got after I got out. Did you finish your education on the GI Bill? Yep. $115 a semester at UConn. 
So that's all it was. <laughs> and what was your degree in? Uh, natural resources. What did you do for a career after you finished? <sighs> a lot of things. Oh. Um, after, after I got out of UConn, I went to work for the state uh, doing weed control at the experiment station, at the agricultural experiment station. I worked there for a couple of years. Then I went to work for my father-in-law as a plumber, which my, my father-in-law was like a, a friend of the family. I'd known him for years and years and years. And my wife was the, the uh, sister of like my best friend. He's the one that got in the airplane crash. So we knew each other forever. So I, I went. I went, I was a plumber. Did that. Did that for quite a quite a while. Um, then eventually I got into uh, uh, being a uh, a plumbing inspector and then a, a building inspector, which is what I which is what I do now. Did you join any veterans organizations? The only one I joined that stayed current with is the VFW, even though I never really go there, but I, I've been a member ever since I got out of the service. Which post? Uh, 591 in Wallingford. Are you active in that post at all now? No, ne never, never was active. I just was always just a member. Bill, how would you say your military experience influenced your thinking about war or about the military in general? Probably not a lot. I, I, I think um, when when I went in, I think I had preconceived notions of what it was what it was going to be like, um, and for the most for the most part, I kind of had it figured out. You know, I, I knew I knew it wasn't going to be like what they had on TV in the movies. Um, I, I, I think I kind of had it figured out. It never. So you got no surprises I, I, when you were. No, I mean, there, there, there were surprises. I mean, one of the things that everybody asks, and I ask too, is how do you tell the difference between incoming and outgoing? Because we had, we had an artillery uh, repair station right next to us, and they were shooting artillery pieces off all the time. And everybody said, when it's incoming, you're going to know it. And sure enough, the first time I ever heard one incoming, I said, incoming. <laughs> how? How did you know? I don't know. You could just tell. It just, it a it just sound? yeah, it just made it made a different sound. I mean, the outgoing always went bang, whoosh, whereas the incoming kind of went whoosh, boom. Then you hear the bang. So that was one way, I guess you could tell, but you could tell. Have but you it attended is, any reunions? No, no, never did. There was actually um, when I was in the National Guard, there were actually a couple of guys who had been in. The same unit I was in in Vietnam. Did you know them when you were over there? I just one one I knew, and then there was one or two other ones that had been in that unit, but I, I didn't know them. They were there either before me or after me. How would you say your service affected your life? I mean, it was. <clears throat> I mean, it was an important part of my life. You know. Um, but as far as the, the overall effect, um, I, I can't, I can't say as I really thought about it that way. I mean, it was just something that I did. Um, you know, most, most of the people who flew, flew because they loved flying, but I, en I ended up doing it because it was a job. And I, I, I think that's the difference. You know, a, a lot of a lot of people uh, were were heartbroken when they got out of the service that they couldn't find a job flying. It didn't it didn't bother me in the least. You know, it's like okay, I did it. I'm I'm glad. <laughs> Have you flown over. since then? No. And you don't no. miss it at all? Not really. It's too dangerous. <laughs> Bill, is there anything you'd like to add that we haven't covered? Any other memorable experiences or incidents that happened? Not really. Nothing I can think of offhand. You will today after we're done. Probably. <laughs> well, I'd like to thank you for your service to our country. Thank you for your interview. Okay, welcome. <laughs>